in a lot of cases, it, you don't have to be the best at something. You just have to continue to stay alive, to continue to operate, to, to every day do a little bit of work and get better. Now, if you have a plan and you have good people and you have funding, that really increases the opportunity success. So what we designed was what became Zen Cash, which uh, launched out of uh, Z Classic. And one, one of the developers that worked on Z Classic you know, had, had the great idea, we could do a chain split. And chain splits were new then. It had happened inadvertently with Ethereum Classic and Ethereum, where basically you started with one coin and went to two. It's fairly common now because Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin did that. And, and that, that's the way a lot of ones launched. But the important thing was that you had to have transaction replay protection. And there was nobody that had written code for transaction replay protection yet. And so some of the, uh, some of the contributing developers at Z Class, Z Classic, excuse me. So contributing developers at Z Classic uh, wrote a basic implementation of transaction replay protection. Turned out to have some issues and timed out and things like that. And so that was part of the, the problem. However, we, we had a successful launch. So we had a successful launch of Zencash with the ideas of privacy, being able to pay for nodes to operate worldwide and to have funding. So it started out as developers and, and managers and marketing. And then with the listing on Bittrex, who was our, our first big exchange. And that was very exciting. So we had actually a project that launched with the ideas of having the, the privacy and eventually distributed government governance and then paying people to operate nodes. And this brought in, as well as miners, of course, miners were a very important uh, part of it. So this brought in different community elements. And that was back to the main strength of a, a thriving cryptocurrency project is to have people that care that you even exist. And, and I mentioned this a lot of times in, in er, early discussions, about, about Zen Cash, which is now Horizon, is the most, uh, the biggest threat to a project is that nobody cares that it exists. So we started out with the idea of having really good private payments uh, for a sustainable system that would work around the world. And we knew that we didn't have all the answers, but we also knew that we, if we had a consistent message um, and a group of people that were the core of the team and ongoing funding that we would be able to grow into what we wanted to do. Uh, we were fortunate that uh, some some uh, we were fortunate that there was some early price rises which gained attention to Zen, uh, but that wasn't the end of the story. So even when the prices went down of all the cryptocurrencies uh, in early 2018, and then continued to go down all the way through, gosh, until this, this past summer here in 2020, we knew that we had a plan. We knew that we had ongoing funding and we were able to put together a team that was able to start doing software development for the vision. And there were some years or there were some times like when the Zen price went really low and then the funding that came in every month wasn't very much. And uh, so it's, it's difficult sometimes, especially for these, these people that you know, are the iconoclasts that like to go against everything. And price in some way is a measure of your success because it's the way that the market looks at you and says, I'm willing to pay for that or I'm not willing to pay for that. And when the price goes really low, I think Zen went down to a price of $3 in USD. Um, that was somewhat of a repudiation of the vision for some people. Uh, and it also reduced the amount of actual monthly uh, funds that could be paid out to the developers. However, you know, um, I, I, I certainly credit Rob with a ton of perseverance and effort and uh, capability of, of really taking what was the initial vague vision and hiring good software developers, um, getting you know, marketing folks in, building a community. And it even though Rob has been the team lead all along, it's all the different people that have been part of the community that have really contributed. So uh, by being the, by internationalizing all the different elements, so the wallets, the node operation instructions, the mining instructions, uh, why Zen is important, why privacy is important, why uh, distributed governance, which we're still working on, why distributed governance is important, 
being able to carry that message into all different languages all across the world has been one of the really strong parts of what has made Horizon successful. And here, especially in the last uh, year and a half, where our software development team, which you know, has now a great presence uh, in Milan and then has uh, distributed uh, folks all over the world. Uh, and then uh, we work with our software development partners of InfoPulse and NTT, uh, CodePartical early on, uh, certainly uh, Alan uh, helping with the node software and actually writing the, the majority of the node tracking and payment software early on. Um, so, and then of course, Alberto with his vision of being able to uh, internalize the ideas of zero knowledge proofs and then extend those to a unique side chain uh, creation, which is, is been on testnet for months now and has a very straightforward, uh, although rigorous software development path to going live on the mainnet next year. So these are the, all the different things that have come together to where Horizon is today. And it feels like we're on the cusp that the recognition of all the vision and work and uh, you know, frankly, in some cases, doubt about the, the path that we're on uh, is coming together and is being recognized by, by many different people uh, as to be a good way of, of taking the cryptocurrency uh, capabilities. You know, there's certainly the important one being built off the Bitcoin software and having the idea of a distributed blockchain where everybody has a copy of all the transactions uh, and then being able to have those anywhere. So it's, it's Bitcoin is an alternative to different uh, money from different countries. And I would argue that Zen is just as viable in say, some cases more viable than Bitcoin for doing the same purpose. But we're taking it a step further. So Bitcoin does a, an outstanding job of doing transactions and being an equivalent form of money. With the side chains that we have, we're going to be able to take all the positive parts of a blockchain and then extend it beyond the transactional realm. So by the unique side chain uh, front and backward uh, transfer creation that's uh, been written is there's an entire disassociation between the proof of work main chain and what's happening on the side chains. The main chain doesn't need to know what's going on the side chains. All it needs to know is that the transfers to the side chain of Zen and the transfers back from the side chain of Zen are valid transactions. And those are proved, proven by the zero knowledge proofs that are creation. So that means what kind of things can you do on the side chain? Well, you can do just about anything you want. So you can do distributed applications. And you think of a distributed application as, okay, we're going to uh, track a bunch of information and we're going to have a front end application to be able to use it. So we could do simple things. Uh, we could run, you know, what, what, what a favorite idea that keeps coming up is, is we could run a provably fair Powerball lotto on a side chain. Now, of course, uh, just like with everything else that um, cryptocurrency projects have to put up with, this has to be done in a way that is in a legal compliance with whatever country that the servers are in and, and operating in. Uh, but it's entirely possible to do that. The, the Lambo registry, and it's fun to see with the recent Bitcoin price, price rise, how the idea of buying a Lamborghini has come back into the fore. And uh, fortunately also buying a house, having a family, doing other things that uh, uh, are, are like that. But, but people are talking about buying Lamborghinis and we have a great set of um, a, a software development kit and sample projects on doing a Lambo registry. So a car registry uh, on a side chain app. So you think of any type of, of situation where you have to have a trusted authority that maintains the ownership and the central knowledge. Bitcoin addressed the trusted authority that's required of central banks and of, uh, of all the banks that are around and saying, look, you don't have to have your trust that the country that created the money uh, is operating it in, in a reasonable manner. You can have Bitcoin where everybody comes to a consensus on it. And it's the same thing with the sidechain applications that people are developing for Zen now. I, we have easily over a thousand software developers that have registered and downloaded the software development kit, which is in Java. Uh, and it's in Java, it uses uh, Spring Boot type 
uh, organization, which many people who develop microservices are familiar with. So these people are now, these developers are going through now uh, developing sidechain applications and putting those onto the testnet sidechain. And this is the real power in a distributed open architecture is anyone is uh, available to participate. All you have to do is you have to be able to have an application that adheres to the protocol and then you can sign up and participate. Now these developers uh, that are developing sidechain applications, certainly they need to develop applications that people want to use. They have to have nice front ends. They have to have good reports. Yeah, Spencer, did you have a question? Yeah. That's like, absolutely. That, what you just mentioned about the side chain being accessible. I was having a conversation with a young man the other day. He is an undergraduate student at a local university. I did not know him until I was participating in a technology live stream event. And I happened to run into him and he said, you're wearing a Horizon Team t-shirt. Well, I said, yeah, I was, as a matter of fact. He said, do you know I'm writing my paper on Zendu? He no is way. actually, <laughs> yes. What a small yeah. world. Yes, he is working on a project in Zendu right now. And I put him in touch uh, with the appropriate Discord channel so that he can talk to the people that are writing the project right now. And he was over the moon. So just a guy, we would have had absolutely no knowledge. And that's the beauty of it is that there is no barrier to entry there is not no license. You just do it. So if you know that's a marvelous example right now of something that's going on right now. People talk about well, when's it coming? Well, I guess it's coming pretty fast if undergraduate students are using it. Yeah, I mean, undergraduate students is one of the first languages they learn is Java, and so by being able to have a software development kit that works in Java, it fits hand in glove. Uh, with these types of, of things. And sure, it's easy to say, well, if you want to contribute to the cryptocurrency economy, you can contribute to the Bitcoin code. But I mean, how many people can actually contribute to the Bitcoin uh, code? There's some really good software developers that have been working on that for you know, a good 10, 15, I don't know, they worked on it before it was launched, right? So at least 10 years. Um, and it, it, to me, it would seem hard to be able to contribute to something like that. But by being able to build your entire own blockchain application and slot it into an existing architecture and a protocol that works. Yeah, you just have to come up with a, a good uh, application you know, and make sure that it's written in a way that's economically will work. And this is another thing that I really like about Horizon is the economic incentives to be successful are all right there. So with mining, like we talked about earlier, Spencer, I mean, the economic incentives are there to run your mining machines and help the proof of work chain uh, to thrive. The economic incentives are, are there for being able to run nodes and com uh, have complete copies of the blockchain worldwide. And yeah, we're gonna move the uh, blockchain tracking and payment system to its own dedicated side chain but this goes back to the philosophy of when we first started it, started Zen was we had a bunch of ideas we wanted to accomplish. We knew we couldn't accomplish them all right there and then in the initial launch of the, of the project, but we knew that we could get there eventually. And it takes years to develop good, reliable, secure software. So as long as we can give ourselves runway uh, and the team organization to do that, we knew we'd be able to get there. And we've got a really bright future ahead of us because we've done so much of the work to create a unique and differentiated uh, software code base that provides real value. And so we talked about, okay, uh, a lottery, uh, any kind, a, a registry for cars. And then you think, what are the other types of things where you have to work with an organization and trust that they're looking out for your interests? If you could take that trust and push it out uh, into a distributed blockchain where you have a blockchain explorer that can uh, run reports and see that the, the, the stuff was done properly, well, think about all the different small organizations that uh, want to have votes on things. So, uh, for example, at a high school, you want to have a vote on who's going to be class president, right? So right now, all the votes are submitted to, I don't know, the teachers, maybe, and then those are, they're counted. 
and then the, the class president is selected. Is there real transparency in that? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But if you, if you ran a little high school class president voting thing on a blockchain that was specifically designed for that, that had an easy to use front end, then you could provably show that, uh, especially if it used zero knowledge proofs, that a person's vote was tallied properly. And if you had your own private key, you could check and say, yep, my vote was actually counted and it was counted for the right uh, person to, to vote for a high school class president. And you can extend that in all sorts of different directions because you don't have just information silos when you have uh, an open protocol. So if you want to, for example, and, and I, I know we've talked to different uh, people and organizations about this, uh, if you have a bunch of receivables that you want to factor, do you have to go with a receivable factoring organization or can you make those receivables open to anybody that wants to place a bid on them? So there's, there's business aspects, uh, there's personal aspects and all sorts of things like that. Hey, Rolf, would you explain to the audience what factoring means for invoices? Oh yeah, so uh, most organizations, and, and, I, and I had this when, um, when we were a small business, we, we would sell to uh, different government organizations. So we, we'd sell them hardware, we'd sell them services and government organizations, especially they don't pay until the project is done. So they'd place an order with us and we have to go buy, I don't know, hundred thousand dollars worth of gear. And then it would ship. And in four weeks, we'd uh, go install it. And the installation would take about a month. And then it would uh, take another month to go through the punch list. So three months after we got the order from the organization, we could then build them. Of course, they wanted 30 day terms. Uh, and then sometimes they paid on time, but sometimes they'd extend their receivables to 90 days. So it turns out that we had to front the money of $100,000 and we would get paid back uh, six months later with a little bit of profit. The funny thing about a situation like that is the more successful you are, the more money you have to have. So say instead of doing $100,000 projects, we did 10 of them. Well, then we'd have to come up with a million dollars just to buy the equipment that we could then get paid back with six to nine months later. We didn't have a million dollars sitting around. So we go to a bank and say, can we borrow a million dollars? They're like, why should we lend you a million dollars? How do we know we're gonna get it back? And we go to the bank and say, well, look, we have all these purchase orders from these different organizations. And when we build them, they'll be receivables. You know, So we've done this work, we've put this stuff, here's the money that you owe us. So after we do all the work and we, we build them, then for 30 to 60 to 90 days, we have a receivable that's gonna come in. We don't have the money yet. So we could take a loan out from the bank or we could take these receivables and sell them at a slight discount. I mean, we know that the money is gonna come in from this organization, we're just not sure when it is. But uh, would you rather have your $100,000 uh, in three months or maybe $98,000 right now? Because then you could turn around and do another project if you're successful and buy the equipment and things like that. So uh, there's companies out there that they're like, I got $100,000, I don't know what to do with it, but I'll pay you $98,000 for that receivable. And then I'll just sit on this uh, money that's gonna come from this organization that owes you the money and I'll get the full 100,000 then. So they, they, they make $2,000 in like two or three months uh, just because they happen to have a bunch of money and you don't. So that's, that's what factoring a receivable is. Now, imagine that you're trying to run your business, you're doing all sorts of different things like that. And uh, you're like, well, man, I, I got to factor these receivables. So you go to the guy that you normally work with for factoring receivables, and there might be 200 different people out there that want to buy a receivable, but you get like one or two quotes on it. Are you going to get the best price on factoring your receivable if you get one or two quotes or about 200 quotes? So that's what opening up a system and not having to rely on a trusted authority can do for you. So the people that are doing the work and have the receivables, they can get more money for the receivables when they factor them if they do it in a blockchain type environment. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Do we have a project coming down the road for this? I don't know. Um, I mean, we, we have- That's a perfect, it's a perfect use case, isn't it? It is, it is. So that's the, the funny thing about working in a decentralized open protocol type environment. So, so Ross Sluice has just given someone a million dollar idea, go run with it. Well, I, I mean, there's, there's, there's so many good ideas out there. And, you know, 
you have it, what it takes. It takes a lot of hard work to take good ideas and make it into a working project. So, you know, I'm always sharing ideas. I know other people are always sharing ideas because it's, it's the people that actually do the work to take the good idea. A, a familiar one is, you know, how did YouTube become so successful? I had the idea of streaming videos across the internet. Uh, you know, they should pay me for that. Well, everybody had the idea of, of streaming videos across the internet, but YouTube actually made it happen. So it's the people that do the work and make things happen. They're the ones that make all the, all the difference. So with, um, so one of our, 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 our contractors that we use is, is a private organization, Horizon Labs, right? So many of the, the early engineers that worked for the Zen Blockchain Foundation now work for Horizon Labs, which is great because uh, it's a for-profit organization um, and it, they can work other jobs and things like that. And it's not subject to the, to the up and down prices uh, of Zen. So by having multiple different software organizations uh, that uh, the Zen Blockchain Foundation, which is the nonprofit foundation that receives the, 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 the Zen treasury payments, it, it's really a benefit. And I know Horizon Labs is working on a number of different projects, but Horizon Labs as a private company doesn't have to share what all those projects are and, and uh, where they're coming down. So I would be surprised if Horizon Labs wasn't working on a, uh, a project to factor receivables, but I don't really know. It depends on, on the customers who want it. But there's, there's so many different ideas. So if you want to come up with the idea for a blockchain, a side chain, a standalone side chain project, first ask, what are people interested in? Now, to me, people are most interested in games. So by being able to do games on a side chain, you're going to be able to get uh, people interested. And think of basic games that have stood the test of time uh, and, and that you can you know, play against a central type thing. So that's why I talk about a, a lottery like Powerball is really neat because uh, the, that's one of those types of games that has uh, stood the test of time. There might be other ones, well, you know, think of roulette. Would you like to be able to play an online roulette game on a side chain? I don't know, maybe some people would. So, but they don't all have to, to be gambling type things because the, I think the projects that are really gonna take off are, are gonna go in a couple different directions. They're gonna be the ones aimed at individual people and they're gonna be the ones that are aimed at businesses. So I think taking the idea of a Lambo registry and extending it to different types of registries would be very, very successful. So right now, if you look at um, what does the government do for, to maintain registries? Well, they have real estate registry and they have car registry. And that's, you know, they also do business registries. Right? So those are big, valuable okay. things. And they like to have registries on it for a couple of reasons. First of all, the people want it. Because having a car registry is able to show that you prove ownership of a car. And, and it creates metadata for the car. So if you have a car registry, not only can you prove that you have ownership of it, but you can go to a bank and say, I own a car. I'd like to borrow money. And I will give you the ability to take this car if I don't pay you back the money, uh, collateralized loans. And so by being able to have a car registry, uh, which is you know, enforceable because the bank can then go say to the state, look, um, this money was borrowed. It wasn't paid back. The car was done as collateral. Please transfer the ownership of the car over to me. And so then the bank then owns the car. They could send the repo man out to, to repo the car which isn't a happy ending, but by being able to have a registry of property, it enables uh, the ability to, to borrow money uh, for that property. Perfect example of that, I think, and I'm sure there are projects that are working on it, uh, is title insurance. Title insurance is primarily research. What you're paying when you buy uh, title insurance is proof that the, that the title that you're buying is clear of any encumbrances. And the only way that that can be proven is for people who have gone to courthouses and looked things up. So once that knowledge is established, that, that knowledge can be embedded on an immutable blockchain. And now at that point, what is the marginal cost of, of finding out the most recent transactions involving a particular piece of property? It becomes trivial. So now I think that trial, title insurance should be driven down almost to impulse by checking out of the 7-Eleven. So that's another million dollar idea for someone if they want to have it. And Spencer, that brings up a good general point of, you know, what does title insurance do? It tracks the title and the title is not the land, but it's metadata. It's data about the land. 
And when you create yes. a whole structure of data about real property, you know, you have to have surveyors out there. You have to have courts of law that can enforce it. You have to have written contracts that are enforceable in law. So uh, one of the reasons that the United States has been so successful is to have courts of law that uh, are that actually you know, enforce the law as written. And so you're able to confidently buy land and know that you're going to get it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, all the different countries around the world, they don't have such a strong rule of law and structure of real estate. So all this capital that's locked up uh, into these systems uh, is you're unable to, uh, to release it. And, and a good book uh, and, and, and videos uh, is The Mystery of Capital by uh, Hernando de Cortez, I think. Um, I think I might have that wrong. But that book really opened my eyes to all the capital out there that's locked into systems uh, that don't have a, a, a way of tracking it. So um, instead of trying to reform the government, instead of trying to reform the courts, what you can do is you can build a parallel system that works better. And there's analogies for this. Um, so we're talking over video right now. But if, if we were doing this back in the early 90s, the only way that we would talk is in a pair of wires that's physically connected through the entire phone system uh, connection that would have voltage levels on the wires. It wasn't until the parallel system of the internet was built that completely bypassed the existing phone system that we were then enabled to have video conferences like the one that we're on. So in a lot of cases, when I see people trying to um, implement reforms to an existing system where there's a bunch of entrenched stakeholders that have value in maintaining that system, it's very difficult. AT&T, for example, had the idea of being able to maintain a complete monopoly on the phone system uh, in the United States. I'm sure it was similar in, in other countries. It wasn't until, uh, who was the company, MCI? Uh, there was, uh, it was the, anyway, Sprint, MCI. It was one of those early companies that wanted to carry long distance uh, calls on their own network that took AT&T to court uh, and, and, and won the case that other people were allowed to make calls on an infrastructure other than AT&T's. So these big government supported monopolies in a lot of cases aren't open to change. And that's why you need people that are willing to go up against what the current reality is. And this tends to in a lot of cases be younger people that don't have um, that, 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 that aren't the owners for everything. Um, and, and they're the ones that they have, they don't own the existing system and they have nothing to lose by challenging it. And that's why I, one of the things that's been really uh, enjoyable for me, because I'm not necessarily one of those younger people is to, to work with all these younger people that are challenging the existing system, but they're not challenging it directly. They're building something in parallel that makes it better. And to me, that's really exciting is to build something in parallel that makes it better. And so you think of, okay, so say we're going to build a, I don't know, driver's license system. Okay. Every, uh, every state has a driver's license and they say, okay, here's your identification. Here's your age. Here's your uh, uh, proof that you've passed the test to do a driver's license. But it's, it's really difficult. It's tedious to get a new license. You need to go in person. You need to work with the Department of Motor Vehicle Peoples. And sometimes, you know, I've gone to the DMV and had to wait three or four hours just to see somebody because they're a government organization and they're not necessarily incentivized uh, to work faster. So imagine that someone builds a driver's license blockchain application, but doesn't try to get it approved by the state. Just, hey, what we're going to do is we're just going to validate your existing driver's license. And then we'll have these people that we uh, trust to put in uh, driver's tests, maybe all the different uh, private driving test companies out there. And pretty soon a parallel driver's license system is built. You know, you get your driver's license as an app on the phone. You want to uh, go to a place and order a beer where you have to show that you're a certain age. Uh, you can just show your app to, to prove that you're 18. Uh, or 21 or whatever the drinking age is, is wherever you are there, they can directly query the blockchain and you don't have to show them your home address, which is what you'd have to do if you show somebody your ID now. And I have three daughters. I don't necessarily want them to show their home address to, you know, various random people just to prove that they're of drinking age. And so a, a, a type of, and then you don't have to have a whole department of motor vehicles full of people that have jobs that run their own proprietary computer system to have a driver's license. 
And then once you have a driver's license blockchain, you can extend that blockchain worldwide. So all of a sudden you have an international driver's license that's running on a driver's license blockchain that's usable by people worldwide. All of a sudden you've taken something that didn't work as well as an existing driver's license system and you've made something that's 10 times as good at 10, to at 10 times less price. So those are the types of sidechain applications that are enabled on, well, full up blockchain applications that are enabled by the sidechain systems on Horizon. That's why I'm really excited to be part of this project. And it's still early. Gosh, we're, we're doing all sorts of different things. Our, our software developers are working so hard to get the sidechain transfers done and, and put onto the main chain live into production. Probably not going to happen until the first or second quarter of, of next year, 2021. But that doesn't mean that uh, we're just waiting on software developers. Software developers right now can write sidechain applications and run them on the test net. So they can take all these ideas that they have for you know, putting together a, a blockchain application, creating the back end for it, creating the right incentivization structure for uh, people to run block forging nodes. Um, and because the people that, that design the sidechain applications are going to have to design in a little bit of funds for the people to transfer the funds to the sidechain and a little bit of funds to pay for uh, block forgers to operate on the sidechain. Um, so there has to be, as you're thinking about what type of system to design for a standalone blockchain application running on a Zen sidechain, you have to think about something where uh, it involves transactions and a small portion of that transaction could be used to pay, pay for fees. So we started out with the idea of having um, a type of cryptocurrency project that could change the world. And here four years later, as the having happens, we're still going down that journey and it's really exciting to be part of it. I've met so many great people from around the world. I can't wait till we don't have these travel restrictions again. Uh, and I can travel around the world and meet different people that I've met uh, from you know, the Discord, from the Telegram, from working with projects. And just like any other project or organization, you know, people come in, they work for a while with it, they go on uh, somewhere else. Some people stay around for a while. But anybody that's ever been part of this project, you know, I consider... Um, consider a member of the Horizon family, and I would love to, to meet them, shake their hand, uh, and have a discussion. Uh, so this, this, is, this is really fun to be part of. Well, thank you, Rolf Persuades.